What up, Reeks? It's me. Today I bring to you the final part of the 1997 version of Berserk. For those supple minds that yearn for the knowledge I offer, check out the other parts if you miss them or actually want to watch in chronological order. I have a playlist somewhere here on screen with all of those. Anyway, when we last left off, Guts doesn't want to be caught up in Griffith's dream and is leaving the band of the hawk when Judo and Corcus scurry up to talk. Casca has some kind of brain blast and runs away to find Griffith. At a bar, Judds and Guts discuss his reasons for parting, while Sir Corcus flirts. His seduction techniques are much too loud for the others to maintain a conversation, though. Corcus unrelentingly explains how, as commanders of the Band of the Hawk, they have more authority than most of the kingdom, and with a little extra work, might even become landed lords one day. He continues to say that it was all earned with blood, sweat, and bird helmets. Corcus doesn't get why Guts would throw all of that away. Hut responds by stating that that he has only ever known battle, and so, recalls his entire backstory leading up to when he met Griffith, the only person he ever wanted to garner attention from. Guts cuts his story short, simply saying that he has had enough of looking up at Griffith and wants to become his equal instead. Dorcas calls him foolish for attempting to strive for heights beyond his reach by dismissing his ambition as just childish dreams. This has a double-edged effect, as Guts retorts by asking what Corcus is trying to achieve. Bongos has had enough and storms off. Judo goes ahead and explains that Corcus was a thief before being in the band, likely trying to achieve his own goals with his own hands back then. As for Judo himself, he's a renaissance man who got swept up in Griffith's formidable wake. On the walk back, Judy tells Guts to ask Casca to prom. She definitely can't partner up with Griffith, so he may as well. Guts politely declines due to seeing Casca more like a comrade who's in love with Griffith. Judo seems disappointed. Later, the homies formed an ambush with Rickert leading the charge. It's Griffith who bluntly asks if Guts is resigning. He is. The gaze. Rick goes feral, but Judo calms him down. Corcus verbally tears Guts apart with insults and goes to sulk by the tree. Where did Griffith go in this shot, by the way? Nuts thanks, thanks them for everything and walks past Casca into Griffith's sword. The homies take their turns being individually shook. Griffith states that Guts belongs to him because of the duel they had when they met. If he wants to rest free from that bond, then he must claim his right to freedom by winning a duel. They take their positions. Casca rushes to stop them, but only the boys understand. Casica is distraught, but it's not their place to intervene. Judo reflects on how she has changed from being a Griffith gooner to a Guts gusher. Griffith and Gups look serious. Guts monologues to himself for inspiration. Casca also monologues to herself for inspiration, which is when she finds out that she actually likes Guts romantically. Griffith analyzes Guts' moves, but finds no weaknesses. He doesn't want his best soldier to leave, so we big brain some advanced sorting techniques in preparation. Some snow flops off this branch and they strike. Guts slices Grithel's saber in twain with a singular blow. It's quite dramatic. Griffith falls to his knees in response. The homies rush over to find him bewildered. Guts says his goodbyes and plods off into the distance. Casca is conflicted. She calls out to Guts as he departs. It has no effect. Rick is sad. Corcus refuses to reevaluate his opinion of Guts. Casp is also sad. Guts figures that Griffith will pick himself up and start walking again in no time. And it's raining. Maybe foreshadowing? Charlotte goes to the bedtimes, but there is a surprise visitor in the night. It's Grealift, probably here to sort his feelings out in light of his manly breakup with Guts. She opens the window to accept him into her chambers. Charlotte was sick with worry with all the assassinations going on and clings tightly to Griffinol. He sniffed a little bit of the devil's dust on his way over and is about to enter goblin mode with cheat codes enabled. They do a romance. Charlotte resists weakly, but this all seems consensual, if not a tad hebephilic. Casca goes to smell Guts' used items and decides to just hug them instead. This maid goes on her patrol duties, finding a lascivious scene after investigating further. She immediately goes to snitch. Later, Charlotte has been defiled and Griffith is traumatized. He mentally projects himself as a depressed egg in response. Charlotte is alone. Griffith is instantly arrested by the entire Chicago police force while fleeing. These fellas whack each other with metal objects, shoot circles, and lift boulders, while this regal looking guy watches in excitement. A notable contestant has made an appearance, Metal Gimp Valencia. Some other guy waltzes in to steal the duel though. Valentina's opponent attempts to stop him, but fails. Guts challenges Valkymer to a duel. The Lord doesn't see why not, and they prepare to fight. Valencia is taunted by Guts's lax 
stance. There is drama. Val misses, then gets his stick sliced in half. He yields. The crowd celebrates. The little guy invites Guts to party with him, but he's much too cool to do so. Later, by a cabin, a fetus arranges some rocks. Guts is greeted with open arms. Her dad is a blacksmith that he's been staying with. He's also been constantly fixing Guts's thoroughly used anime blade. The wise old blacksmith talks to the sword, whose master is unaware of his own destiny, apparently. Out of context, that seems like senility just uttering some nonsense. But since he's talking about Guts, the old guy probably tapped into some funky elder juju, which tells him demonic secrets or something. I don't know. Guts does some classic waterfall training while reflecting on what his destiny is. Could it be his sword is his destiny? He doesn't know, but he almost dies by log accident. The little girl figures that was too many logs, while Guts ogles his sword, realizing that it is basically part of his body now. He does a ton of training in various ways, almost dying by log accident again. I guess cutting trees in half with your sword is taxing on it. Guts asks why old guy became a smith, but his family has just always done it. Now he continues to slap iron without thinking too much about it, but he does like the sparks. With every swing, he can see his life and the resulting conflagration. Later, Guts reflects on that. The sparks of clashing swords, then goes to chop logs again. This time, he easily blasts them. I think he achieved enlightenment by figuring out that he'll wield his swords for himself to keep chasing that high of mass murder. He goes to depart in classic Guts fashion. The old guy bids him farewell after sheltering Guts for an entire year. Suddenly, dark fantasy Paul Revere shows up on horseback, downs a whole juice in one suck, then places an order on a billion swords. There are bandits in the area, fugitives, ripe for the picking. Apparently, the bandits are members of a mercenary band led by a woman who staged a rebellion in the capital a year ago. This sounds like the Band of the Hawk, probably, given the circumstances. Guts throttles him, revealing just that. He is shook. Sometime during the night, the fashion police arrive to arrest the Band of the Hawk while they sleep. They look pretty ragged. Here's Casca, who seems like she's at least physically uninjured. Judo shows up to console her. And Unfortunately, she recently got a report that someone who might be Griffith is rumored to be held in a maximum security prison underneath the regular prison. The sounds of his moans echo through the corridors. However, those dirges have been silent for a month now. He might be long dead, but the mission to rescue him must go on for morale reasons. As Big J leaves, Casca thanks him. She attempts to consume the soup, but fails. The homies discuss her notable achievements in keeping the band together. Corcus isn't so happy about any of this stating that the band is nothing without Griffith's leadership. Rick tries to talk some sense into him, but Griffith might not even be alive. And yet, Dorcas has stuck around this far. Everyone felt that. An ambush. That's way too many arrows for one guy. The band goes to fend off the attackers. Casca makes some succinct commands. Her house explodes. Then she ices three dudes in quick succession. She's slippy on some dust, facing her steely doom. But her aggressor is launched into the flames. Everyone takes turns being shook. It's the legendary ex-battalion commander of the White Hawks, Nuts. Casca returns to the heat of the battle, and the clash continues. The enemy is resilient, but the homies are infinitely more skilled. None of the assailants seem to know how to approach Guts. They attack at once, but are felled in swathes. They're shook. Guts has still got it. Casca notices this. The enemy does too, and orders a retreat. The homies make a charge at Guts, who greets them with a thumbs up. Casca isolates herself and maintains seriousness, ordering the troop to get moving quick. Later, Judo reports their circumstances. The band is hardly even an army anymore. A year ago, everyone gathered under Griffith's orders, but he never showed. Pippin hears a sound and utters his first words, get down, it's arrows. Not a nice present from the kingdom they just saved. They all found out later that Griffith had been captured for treason. Guts is shook. The day he left, Groping got depresso and caved under the pressure. Guts reflects on this. Dongus sulks out loud briefly. Ricky continues to report that Casca earned the glory of becoming the leader after hastening their recovery from the horrendous ambush. Then Judo takes over, saying that they are staging an operation to rescue Griffith. They all make the shared face of purposefulness. The only thing they have left is courage and willpower, so the mission will be running on fumes at most. But the Band of the Hawk doesn't exist without Griffith. Corcus isn't so sure about letting Guts become part of the expedition, and downs a whole flask. Cups understands and goes to Sulk, but Juto tells him in secret to take care of Casca, who has been in a sorry state for the past year, pushing herself further than ever before. My man Judd's pieces out. Time for romance? I guess this is the maximum security prison. That's an Iron Maiden. And this here is Griffith, who's been enduring 
enjoying a wretched existence under the attentive care of dark fantasy Al Leong, who enjoys stabbing. He also takes an interest in Gribble's necklace, which he just now decided to toss into the sewer. Meanwhile, Guts sulks, then is approached by Costco, who invites him to talk. She wishes to duel, makes a surprise attack, then continues to swing wildly. She is danced around by a confused Gut. She blames him for destroying everything, in true Sunder A fashion. Guts doesn't understand how he caused the downfall of the Hawks, but Casca informs him that Griffith is still a human being, capable of mistakes. She seemed to be the only one who understood this, claiming that Guts was what made Griffith weak. Huts is run through out of guilt, stating that he saw no other option but to leave. Casca breaks down, caving to Gus' reasons, but claiming that she hasn't been able to accept any of the last year of traumas. She continues to state that she already knew that Griffith would end up marrying the princess, and she never stood a chance romantically. But the day that Gus left, Casca finally realized that her dreams of staying with Griffith were already over. She backs up to the edge of the cliff while suspiciously looking quite depressed, and yeets off. Guts is quick though, and she survives her Sudoku puzzle. Guts is peeved, but Casca calls him a fool for always hurting himself for others. They do a brief romance while Carpso cries. She has a hallucination of the time when Guts walked away after defeating Griffith. She thought he looked so cool back then. They do a more involved romance in the forest, I guess. Casca invites him to stay with the band, but Guts only wants to help return things to normalcy. He doesn't wish to follow another's dream ever again. Casca laughs at his stubborn nobility, equating him to Griffith and becoming upset, she viciously attacks his formidable carapace to express her feelings, but exposes herself instead. Butts takes this opportunity to invite her to join his adventures. They do another brief romance while in the nude. Later, this tree makes a sound when felled, and these lumberjacks are not okay. It was seen the time of the demon's awakening has arrived. Behel it. The band prepares for their rescue mission, with Casca taking the lead, and they head out. We get to experience what it's like to be Griffith while he is approached by little goblin demons. They greet their prince and conjure some Penrose doors. In a cemetery somewhere, the homies emerge into existence to look for a secret passage into the dungeons. Pippi opens the sesame, but Guts is worried about Casper, who berates him for trying to stop her. They crawl into the hole. It is moist. Guts has visions of Griffith being helpless without him. The band are by the possibility of Griffith returning. Rick goes to fetch some water, but encounters a moth. It majorly spooks him and flies into the forest, suddenly screaming from within. I think that moth probably just ate everyone, or they just disappeared. Look, half a guy. We get a better look-see here. It's a worm. Ricky is shook. It gulps that feller down like a seagull deep-throating glizzies during a baseball game. Richard encounters a river of blood, leading to a pile of insects feasting on his homies. Oh no, the moth is hot. Ricky is twice shook. Meanwhile, the main Griff squad make it through to the castle and encounters the princess's servants, who have been helping them all along. At the prison, they just walk in the front door after icing the guards. Griffith monologues about the oppressive darkness he's been subjected to then astrally projects himself into Guts's brain to watch him walk around. Griffith mulls over the feelings that Guts gives him, a real mixed bag of beans there. He seems to both hate and love the fact that his golden boy has come to rescue him. They spot the husk of Grippy sprawled out on the floor, emaciated and withered. They are shook. The tendons in his arms and legs have been cut as well as his tongue. Griffith will no longer be able to walk or speak, and as they remove his bird hat, discover something which the audience doesn't get to see. Griffith awakens reaches out to Gut and attempts to strangle him. It doesn't work and is only met with tears. It was a trap. There is no escape now. Our resident torturer threatens them, but he made the poor decision to direct his wrath towards Guts. No door is thicker than Guts's big sword, and the merciless tormentor is cast into a convenient hole nearby. Unfortunately, the invaders still have yet to contend with the guards. Guts actually doesn't care and goes nuts. Not even projectiles can cramp his style, as he tosses the entire prison's garret and down the chasm of convenience. The kingdom's soldiers await at the entrance to greet whatever horrors crawl through the doors. Their leader doesn't believe in Guts's legend, but unhinges his snake-like jaw and consumes those words whole. The instant he barrels through the door, the soldiers are shook and hesitate to attack. Their commander berates them while Guts pants, but after catching his breath, Grunts continues his rampage. Meanwhile, the getaway vehicle is concerned by their delay. The homies struggle to keep up with Guts, but once they do, Casca touches 
touches his face a little bit. This calms him down, I think. Griffith eyeballs their romance. From within his flesh prison, Mustache Knight is frightful of the impact this prison break will have on his career. The caravan is sighted, but the kingdom is in pursuit. The soldiers are much too fast, however, and begin to catch up. Corcus unleashes a barrage of arrows just in time, thinning the enemy's ranks and allowing the hawks to go on the offensive. The getaway wagon is hit by an airstrike shortly afterwards, though, and the band of the hawk are surrounded and pacified. The enemy commander reveals the sad truth of the matter by exposing Griffith's withered bod to the band. Gus goes ahead and stops his nonsense by slaughtering the entire battalion of soldiers. Later, the homies are forlorn, and their rescued prince has become a vegetable. Corcus doesn't believe it, but the solemn silence from Casca reveals the truth. He has a mental breakdown, which is understandable given their circumstances. It looks like everyone else is also having a mint TV. Dorcas busts his sword upon a rock with sorrow, but the band of the hawk is officially no more. Casca asks for some time to think things over and walks off. Guts follows to give her career advice in pursuing goals, but she retorts by stating that not everyone can follow through with their ambitions. Guts is shook, probably because this is the opposite of what he's been philosophizing about for the past year. Casca seems to just want someone to comfort her at this point, receives an embrace, then goes to check on Griplet. Judo and Guts speak about the future. Judds figures that he'll form a band of thieves out of a few of the guys, and insists once again that Guts take Casca with him. Some of the remaining fellas wish to follow Guts as well, eager to accept him as their leader. This causes him to realize that this is what he wanted all along. Griffith is encased in toilet paper, while Casca reflects on how small his hands are now. She can't seem to get the knot right on his bindings, knocks over a bowl, and is stared at intently by Griffith's husk. Later, she cries, but fails to hide her tears in front of Guts. She can't seem to tear herself from Griffith's withered form. Guts insists that he stay behind with him because of this, but Casca doesn't want him to. Meanwhile, Griffith is having visions of his past self who remind him of his dream. The hallucinations return some glimmer of hope in his eyes, and he activates the carriage with his teeth, after which he runs into a rock and hurls through the air. He awakens to Lady Casca, giving him soup and speaking about the past. They haven't been visited by the homies in a while, and even named their kid after Guts. Griffith figures this peaceful life isn't so bad, but peeps at the Behelet and awakens a second time. His little arms remind him of reality, so he impales himself on a convenient spike, but fails to accomplish much. Behelet. Griffith is shook. He remembers that the egg of the king offers the flesh and blood of its owner in exchange for power. Guts rushes to Grither's aid while contemplating what he can do to even help. Suddenly, the homies spot a solar eclipse. The behelet is up to something sinister here. Griffith recoils from the sight of Guts approaching and tries to tell him to stay away, but the eclipse has already begun to summon an army of demons. Guts goes to grasp, but once he does, the behelet wiggles into its final form, transfiguring the localized area into a tool music video. All the homies don't know what's going on at all. Same. Casca takes control, ordering that they forget about what they don't understand and get into formation. Guts is impressed with her valor, then spots the behelet, which wasn't there before, and is now up to some horror nonsense. The demons chant some esoteric stuff about the great eclipse of darkness, beckoning the four rulers of supreme beings to the banquet. This massive winged lady breaches the sea of heads, unaware that she is totally nude. The mega babe peeps the homies, while Beetleman John Lennon writhes his way out of a wormhole to check Cork is out. The owner of the wormhole arrives, and so too does this creature, who manifests out of the eclipse's umbra. Ew, it's some kind of alien. And that's the gang all together, I think. The plebs celebrate their esteemed arrival. Gigabrain welcomes everyone to the divine banquet, specifically Griffith, the apostle, appointed one, chosen by the hand of God, their kin, and long-awaited blessed king. Guts doesn't want any of this demonic nonsense messing with his homie. This causes the demons to laugh, and the mega slut to yearn for his sacrifice. She informs them that such means are unnecessary to create a demon king. The Behelet was the catalyst for this. In fact, all the demons here today have used Behelets in the past. However, Griffith's tomato was no ordinary garden vegetable. It is specifically meant for a being who will become akin to the four rulers. These words cause the demons to metamorphose in excitement. Gus, understandably, doesn't approve of being sacrificed to birth a demon king, but through Griffith's will, their sacrifice will come to pass via the flow of causality, which I guess just means that all of this was meant to happen. The foliage of heads turns into a meat pylon, taking Griffith up into the air with guts attached. Foot's slippy, but Griffith holds on, hmm, holds on temporarily because Griff skipped arm day a few too many times. Gus manages to catch himself though. Big hand.
Casca is shook. That's when the demons begin chanting the word baptism. Griffith is chilling out in the palm, while the supreme goofers ask rhetorical questions. Beetleman John Lennon infiltrates Griffith's mind to show him visions of the past. Fetal Grippy is lost in a city on his way to a castle. This old lady shows him the way, so he sprints off. Get tricked, nerd. It was just corpses that way. The old lady, who I think gave him the behillet, informs him that this field of bodies was produced as a necessary sacrifice to achieve his goals. It's a kill or be killed type environment. Here is an example right now. The only friend that Griffith made was a victim of that outlook. The ghosts of Griffith's past haunt him for a bit, eager to see what kingdom he builds with his dream. Maybe Grithel collapses with regret. The old lady scolds him for being remorseful about the death of all these people. I guess he's building a flash bridge out of these bodies to metaphorically make his way to the castle. This symbolistic lecture persists for a while as Griffith continues to be troubled. Guts astrally manifests himself to inspire him, while the old lady beckons him to continue piling up corpses. And so Griffith picks up his slain homie and keeps going. Back in reality, probably, Griffith is lectured again by the demon squad. While Guts scales the flesh hand, the freaky cauliflower alien invites Griffith to continue their ritual, summoning his green magic. Suddenly, Guts makes it to the peak and calls out to Griffith, who, amidst the juxtaposition, and despite the fact that they have a very real friendship, decides that since Guts made him forget his dream, gives the command to sacrifice them all, and so the promised hour has arrived, and the sacrifices are branded with the demon letters. There is much rejoicing. The band of the hawk gets chewed up by all the demons. Casca is shook, so is Guts. He can't seem to pierce the hardened shell of faces with his tiny dagger. The demon lords try to explain, but to no avail. Guts manages to peer through the fleshy wall to spot Griffith's incubation. All the homies continue being eviscerated while he watches, and now, surrounded by voracious demons faces his reckoning. Casca has entered a trance, but Pippin breaks her out of the spell, uttering his second word ever, run. Judo evacuates her, much to Casca's dissatisfaction. He intends to not let the band of the hawk be annihilated in such a way. Rest in peace, Pippi, one of the realest of the real ones. Dorcas is chased down a flesh cliff and witnesses the brutal demise of some guy. He drifts in a dreamlike haze, stumbling around, proclaiming that none of this is real. A mega babe appears before him, reveals her titties, then turns into an alien. Judo's arm gets snagged as they flee. It's a terrible wound. Casca wishes to fight, but Judo understands that they're out of their element. Their horse is eaten by a floor blob, and Judo meets his corporeal doom by a tentacle beast. He takes one last bite at the enemy before losing all of his strength. Casca doesn't wish for him to perish, but Judd's has already begun talking about himself in past tense. He reassures her with his last words, then dies a true warrior's death. Casca remains alone taking up her fallen comrade's sword and charging her foe. I guess she stands no chance. The demons wish to engage in lascivious deeds. Meanwhile, Guts has torn off something's ribbed horn and is going nuts with it. He impresses the demon lords with his ferocity. The mega slut finds it ironic that the stronger his vitality, the more powerful Griffith will become once he hatches. Speaking of which, here we are, inside of his consciousness, witnessing the absorption of the band of the hawk into Griffith's soul energies or something. He's slowly becoming a demon with the waning of his humanity. God or something shows him the teardrops of Behilitz in the meantime. Guts is still going nuts and has lost his shirt at some point. He finds himself in a sea of blood, surrounded by the scattered corpses of his homies. There is one who remains alive, but things don't look good. Gaston's brain explodes. Pippo. He's just a meat homunculus, possessed by a fuzzy caterpillar though. All the homies are presented like a ghastly ornaments. Guts curses his foes for their brutality, then spots Kaskar, nude, unconscious, and tentacled up. He goes nuts again, but forgets that he's in demon land and gets his arm bit. Kaska faces lewd defilement, but suddenly Dark Griffith is born from his flesh egg and given the demon name Femto. He metamorphosed into a beautiful butterfly, flutters to Guts, summons Kaska, then begins the cuckening. Guts is imprisoned and cannot act. He was powerless as the woman he loves is done had by another man. The vice grip of the demon detaining him does not relent, and so Gut has no other option but to mangle his arm with the broken blade of his knife to escape. Casca does a gasm as he frees himself, but Guts is pinned to the floor and forced to watch. Mega Slut is in absolute bliss at the beauty of humanity unfurling before her. Guts screams helplessly as his vision is blotted from blood, and that's the end of the 
1997 version of Berserk sort of got somehow makes it out of all of that mess and ends up reuniting with the old blacksmith he was staying with, revolving the story around back to the beginning when our boy was out there whacking some snake demon. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the series, like, comment, subscribe, and maybe even sign up to my Patreon if you feel like it. I wish that this series got more seasons than just this one. There are totally no other series or spin-offs of this at all, so it sucks that it doesn't continue except in the manga. But as we all know, I can't read. Uh, I think that's it for the outro. Bye.